All right, hello, I'm back. I had to go, uh, but now I'm back. <laughs> so um, I was at the fact about this indexing variable i, um, and I was saying that x sub i is equal to a plus i delta x, uh, this x sub i here. So what I, the way I've always thought about it is that it's, it's an arithmetic series, right? If you think back from algebra 2, you remember you had... Um, if you're trying to find the nth term, right, a sub n, that was just a sub 1 plus that uh, difference, right, n minus 1, d. Um, so, you know, you had, if you had like 1, 3, 5, 7, if you wanted to find 7, you knew that the common difference was 2, you could just do 1 plus, um, and then this would be your, 7 would be your uh, fourth term. So 3 times 2, which gives you a 7. So it it's, works very much the same way. You go, in other words, this x sub i right here, uh, the x value of the ith rectangle is just your starting x value plus uh, your common difference. In other words, how many, this just tells you how many rectangles you have to go. There's delta, you know, you go a distance delta x, and there's i of them. Um, that that hopefully makes sense with you. So uh, writing it out more formally, we can write that that's the limit as n approaches infinity of the summation from i equals 1 to n of f of a plus i delta x times, oh, and actually, we can do even better, um, because delta x, if you remember, is just b minus a over n. b minus a over n times b minus a over n. Now, this may look a little messy, but to me, and I guess to someone first learning it, you can see where the parts of this integral come into play in the limit definition of it, right? You see where you literally see where your a and where your b are right um and the n is you see that that is directly related to uh the fact that the infinite amount of rectangles will give you the exact area um so let's actually do an example here and i'm going to talk about uh you know different methods of approximating or, or getting the answer um well, first, I guess approximating and then um, actually taking that limit to infinity. So let's say that we have, uh, oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I actually, I want to draw it good this time it's because I'm going to be doing rectangles and things. So let me get the straight line tool. Um, let's say y is equal to x squared. So y is equal to x squared and... Let's say we want to find or uh, approximate that area from, say, 0 to 4. That's 4. Um, and let's say we want to approximate it with, uh, I don't want to make my life too hard, so let's say 5 rectangles. In other words, n is equal to 5. Now, they're equally spaced, so delta x is going to be 4 minus 0 over 5, or 4 fifths. And that should make sense because 4 fifths times 5 gives you your ending value of 4. So I'm going to try and draw these roughly. And I'm going to be using a, a right hand or a right uh, approximation to start. So, uh, oh, that's over. Yeah. I'm going to draw it like this instead. There's one. There's two, um, there's three, there's four, and there is five. So it would be looking something like this. Now, uh, since we're using a right-hand approximation and since the function is, is increasing, this, you should know, is going to be an overestimate of the area. And if we were to use a left-hand approximation, in other words, if the uh, rectangles were touching the, um, 
you know, the left side of the rectangles were touching the, uh, well, this would just be a flat rectangle because at zero, it's touching the origin. We would get an underestimate because the function is uh, increasing, right? Like this, something like this. So every rectangle here is under the curve. Every rectangle here is over the curve by a little bit. So this is an underestimate. So now, um, I think since I used five, I'm going to actually, oh, oops, that was bigger than I thought, that, rec that eraser. So uh, I'm going to actually use five here because uh, I've got five rectangles and it'll just make the arithmetic a little nicer on me. So what we're saying is that these rectangles are touching at their right points. On, so in other words, the, the rectangles touching at the right point, uh, the functional value is equal to the right point of the rectangle is what I'm getting at. So we just find the area of the five rectangles and add them up. Um, now, each rectangle is going to be multiplied by a constant width. Oh, and now if I change delta x to uh, 5 instead of 4, then this will be 5 minus 0 over 5, which is just um, uh, 5 over 5, which is just 1. So uh, I, I guess I'll write it out first. Uh, for first. The, first, the area of the first rectangle is going to be f of 1 times delta x. Uh, plus f of 2 times delta x plus f of 3 times delta x uh, plus f of 5. You know, we'd have an f of 4 there. I just threw dot, dot, dot times delta x. Now we can pull out a delta x, which is really just a 1. So we uh, are going to get the same thing. Um, now, 1 times f of 1. What's f of 1? It's... Uh, 1 squared, which is just 1, plus f of 2, 2 squared is 4, plus f of 3, 3 squared is 9, uh, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25, and 25, 16, 9, 4, and 1. Let's see. I am going to use my calculator. That's going to be 55. So, uh, using a right-hand approximation, that area is 55. Using a left-hand approximation, well, we'd still have a delta x out front. We'd still be multiplying by that delta x, which is just 1. That's constant. The rectangles are keeping a constant width apart from each other. But now, realize in the left-hand approximation, we're doing f of 0 plus f of 1 plus f of 2 plus f of 3. Oh, I only drew 4. Um, one more here. Plus f of 4. So f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, f of 4. Okay. f of 0 is 0 squared, which is 0. f of 1 is 1 squared, 1. 2 squared, 4. 3 squared, 9. 4 squared, 16. And uh, we get the sum of those is going to be 30. So just as I said up here, this overestimates the true area. This underestimates the true area. And later on, we'll find that the true, whoa, we'll find that the true area is just the integral from 0 to 5 of x squared um, dx, which is just a third x cubed, um, evaluated from 0 to 5. That's going to be 125 thirds, which is going to be... Um, of 41 and two thirds. So uh, this is actually a, a better approximation, which should make sense because there is a little less excess area under the curve in the underestimate. Um, okay, now there's another way of approximating this area that will give us a, a better estimate if we consider, instead of right and left, we consider, you can think of it as the average of right and left, in other words, the midpoint. So what that tells us is that the midpoint of this rectangle will be touching uh, 
the the function. In other words, the midpoint of the rectangle will be equal to the functional value. So uh, this is five. This is zero. So the midpoint be I should one two three four five. Actually, I'm gonna help myself with these grid lines here. I'm gonna make this five. That way I uh, have a have a better two three four. Did I just erase the same thing? Okay, zeros over here. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, whoops. Yep. Uh -huh. Five is here <laughs> because now they're they're the grid lines are spaced by one, and uh, that'll make it easier. So point five is just in the middle. That's about here. So our first rectangle will be touching this uh, here. Uh, the second rectangle will be touching here. So some's going to be above, some's going to be below. The third rectangle will be here, fourth here in the middle, and then five like that. So we have some area that's excess, like that little part, and then some area that is, uh, you know, underestimating, like that area, for example. So if we were to calculate the midpoint approximation for the area under the curve from zero to five, what we would do is we would take, well, first of all, we'd have delta x, which would just be one, right? Five minus five over, or five minus zero over five, which is just one. Uh, so we have one times, uh, now instead of f of zero and f of one, since the midpoint of this rectangle is equal to the functional value, we're plugging in f of 0.5, in other words, 0.5 squared, which is 0.25. And then here, this value here, uh, maybe you see it better on the laser pointer right here, is uh, 1.5, and then we're squaring that. And now 1.5, I believe is 2.25 squared, yeah. And then we're plugging in uh, this value here, which is 2.5 squared. And 2.5 squared is 6.25, whoa, I'm still on the laser pointer. 6.25. Um, and then next we're plugging in 3.5 squared. And we're getting 12.25. And lastly, 4.5 squared, which gives us 20.25. So we end up getting, for our area... Uh, we get 0.25 plus 2.25, 6.25, 12.25, 20.25. 20 we get an area of 41.25. Now, I wanted to compute this exact integral here, 41 and 2 thirds, to show you just how much better the midpoint approximation is than a right or a left hand approximation. We only use five rectangles, and we got almost the exact same area. To um, you know, to the to the tenths digit, which is is a is a very good approximation for only five rectangles. Um, another way, <laughs> there's there's many ways that we can approximate this area is known as the trapezoidal rule. Uh, and so what we do there is you ima imagine it like this. You are taking, think of it like this. Your, your, your trapezoidal sum is going to be sigma i equal 1 to, in our case, it would be 5, because there's only going to be 5 rectangles, of 1 half of f of x sub i minus 1 plus f, oh, parenthesis, plus f of x, uh, f, oh, not, that's not a sub there, f of x sub i. So what we're really doing is we're taking the uh, arithmetic mean of the right and the left uh, Riemann sums. So all we're doing, really, if you aren't comfortable with 
the actual geometry behind the trapezoidal rule and you get what I'm talking about with this right and left hand approximation, all you do, all you can do, is, or all you need to do is just take 30 plus 55 and divide it by 2 and you'll get, um, that's going to be uh, 85 over 2, which is 42.5 and that's much uh, better than the uh, 30 and 55 that we had before. Um, so geometrically, what we're saying is that, you know, imagine I've got this function here. We're saying that, um, and maybe I'll draw the, the left here in red. Uh, and then maybe the, the right in blue, be good to see the difference right there. Um, oh, that should have, that one should have been a little above. Um, so the trapezoidal, it will be, you know, for any sub interval, right? Like maybe between this rectangle and this rectangle or the, uh, you know, the points containing the ends of the, the ends of the rectangles that, uh, the area, uh, you know, of the left Riemann sum, this left Riemann sum here, uh, plus the area of the right Riemann sum divided by two is the area for the trapezoidal sum. So with the trapezoidal sum, your area approximations will look roughly uh, like this. They'll go like here to here, and this would be like that, and we have one from here to here, and they would like connect up kind of nice. Your book probably does a better drawing than this, but in other words, you're just having, you're, you're halving, um, not having, half, halving uh, the left uh, Riemann sum plus the right Riemann sum. So the midpoint, some people get confused between the midpoint and the trapezoidal. The trapezoidal is just an average of the outputs of the left and the right Riemann sums. The midpoint uh, sum tells you that instead of uh, the functional value being equal at the left or the right side of the rectangle, we um, make it equal in at the midpoint of that rectangle. So we have some area above, some area below, and it's a better approximation. But you still uh, do it much the same way as um, as a as a left or right hand Riemann sum, the trapezoidal sum. Just take the left one, take the right one, and find their average. That's it. Um, now, I want to uh, actually do an integral. So, and I want to do one that's, um, that has a, has a cube. So, Let's do um mm, I don't know x cubed oh I was in the pen the shape pen oops x cubed plus two mm, x squared plus three x plus four I'm just pulling. Uh, numbers here. And now ideally, you'd want to graph this. And so I'm going to plug it into my graphing calculator now just to see what's going on here with the with the function. And I'm getting that this function is looking something like this. And I would encourage you to, to verify this for yourself. Well, we're gonna have some intercept it's going up like, uh, man, I had the pen shape on again. Something like that. And our intercept here is at, at four. Um, so let's say I wanted to find the area, the exact area from zero, I don't know, to two. 
zero to two. Uh, oh, I <laughs> might need a little more room. <laughs> um, so now it doesn't matter exactly whether you use the left, the right, uh, midpoint or, or trapezoidal, it doesn't really matter because you're taking the limit. All the limits are going to converge to the same thing, right? Whether you use this way or this way or this way, the error, the error in your uh, outside area or your underestimated area goes to zero as the number of rectangles increases. So um, I like I like right the best, so just draw it like this, just to give a rough sketch. This is a really rough sketch, um, but something like this. So delta x is 2 over n. It's 2 minus 0 over n, which is 2 over n, b minus a over n, right? Um, now, x sub i is equal to a, which is 0, plus i times 2 over n. So x sub i is i times 2 over n. And as I did it, I did it somewhere above, we, we, we get the limit uh, for this exact area as n approaches infinity, sigma i equals 1 to n of f of uh, a plus i delta x which is i times 2 over n times delta x, which is 2 over n, which is the limit as n increases without bounds, sigma i equal 1 to n. Uh, now, uh, also I could make this 2i over n. Now I'm going to get uh, n, remember our my original function was f of x is equal to x cubed plus, I think it was 2. Is that what I, I wrote over it? Yeah. 2x squared plus 3x plus 4. So for every x, I'm inputting 2i over n. So, and then I'm going to multiply all that by 2i over n. So this is going to be a really messy one, but I think it's good that I'll do it to test the algebra that goes on. And now, please remember... Don't confuse this, like, i here with, like, i, like, the square root of negative 1. Don't do that. It's an indexing variable. It's not, like, the imaginary unit i. You know, so we're going to get, like, an i squared and an i cubed. Don't make that a negative i, please. Um, okay, so 2i over n cubed. That's 8i cubed over n cubed. Um, plus, now we have... 2i over n squared, that's, and then we're multiplying by that, by that 2. So we're still going to get an 8. That's going to give us 8i squared over n squared plus um, now a 2i over n times a 3. That's going to give us a 6i over n plus a 4. Um, and that's only being multiplied by 2 over n. Oh, and now we're going to have to deal with the powers of 4. Okay. See, well, I'm going to multiply it out, and, and you'll see here. Well, we get the limit as n approaches infinity of sigma i equals 1 to n of 16i uh, cubed n to the over, over n to the 4 plus 16i uh, squared over n cubed plus uh, 12i over n squared plus 8 over n. Okay, now um, realize this here. If you remember from... <laughs> well, let's do it. Why not? <laughs> um, if you remember, if I've got sigma i equal 1 to n, 
of just um, i, that's n times n plus 1 over 2. In other words, it's just the sum of the first n whole numbers. Uh, sigma i equal 1 to n of i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And sigma i equal 1 to n of i cubed is, this is really cool, n times n plus 1 over 2 squared. So, that, and a uh, side note, uh, you know, the sum of the first n cubes is the square of the sum of the first n, uh, n to the first power. In other words, uh, 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus dot 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 plus n cubed is equal to 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 plus n squared. That's a really cool fact. And if it isn't intuitive to you, um, I did make an animated video on it proving those uh, all three of those formulas that I just uh, listed uh, there. And you could watch that if you'd like. I, I honestly think it's, it's a good video. I did spend a good bit of time on it. Um, so let's actually evaluate this now. So where were we? Oh, okay. I think I'm going to write it like this to make it a little easier to see. Limit and increases without bounds. And I, I'm, I'm curious how I, I'm, trying, I'm looking at, at the textbook to see how they write it here. Okay, yeah. See, they split it up like this. I'm trying to match your, your how the textbook does it because I don't actually read the textbook. <laughs> um, they make it um, 16 over n to the fourth sigma i equal 1 to n of i cubed um, plus 16 over n cubed times sigma i equal 1 to n of i squared plus 12 over n squared sigma i equal 1 to n of i plus um, 8 sigma i equal 1 to n of uh, what's it, 8 over n? Oop, 8 over n, and that's just a 1 there um, because this is really 8 times 1, right? So why did we do that? We did that because um, n is... Uh, right, i is, I, is, I is what's changing. Um, i is what is our, what our indexing variable is. Um so uh, the constants, right? The three over the threes, the the constants, like the numbers and the ends, uh, you can pull them out of of summation symbols, right? Like if I have sigma i equals one to n to of c times f of x, uh, you know, you can pull that c out and make it c times sigma i equal one to n of f of x. Um, so constants can come out of summation signs. And that's exactly what they do here, because this uh, is a constant, and all the ends are constants, so you pull them out and make them constants. Now, we get the limit as n approaches infinity of 16 over n to the fourth times... Now, how do I want to write this? I think I want to just make it n squared times n plus 1 squared over four, and all I did was just square this over here to get that, if you don't see that immediately. Plus 16 over n cubed um, times n times n plus one times two n plus one 
over 6 <laughs> plus 12 over n squared, um, and then this is going to be multiplied by n times n plus 1 over 2 plus 8 over n times n. Uh, if you don't see this sum, this is just, all that's saying is adding up 1 plus a 1 plus a 1 plus a, a 1, where we have n ones. So that's where we get this n here from. Um, okay. Now, I can do some rearranging. This is the limit as n increases without bounds of now I'm not sure if I just want to I mean there's a number of ways I could do it How, what's the way that's easiest for you to see well I could make this n to the fourth n, n times n times n times n, right? So let's let's try that. We have sixteen times n over n, where we get one one from this n and one from that n, times uh, n over n times n plus 1 over n times n plus 1 over n. So I just split up my exponents, right? This n over n comes from here, comes from here, and now I've got another one coming from here and coming from here, which is this now. And now I still have two more n's here, so I can make an n plus 1 over n and another n plus 1 over n like that, and the 16 will still be out front. So, um, now we're adding 16 times n over n, uh, so one of these with one of those, times n plus 1 over n, times 2n plus 1 over n, and I'm, I don't think I'm going to have enough room <laughs> to fit this all in one line. I should have moved over some. Um, now, or the next one, 12 times n over n. Oh. Oh, whoopsies. This, I, I, mi I mi mi missed a step here. This 4 here, I should have divided by a 4 here. I forgot those. Uh, and then 16 over 6, and then 12 over 2. Yeah, whoopsies. Good thing I caught that. Um, n over n times n plus 1 over n. And lastly, plus eight times n over n. Oh, I did have enough room, okay. Now, look at this limit, look at this limit. We get the limit as n increases without bounds of n over n is one, n over n is one, n plus one over n is one, n plus one over n is one, uh, n over n is one, one. This is a two because we have two n plus one. Uh, one, one, um, one. <laughs> it, it's really that easy. Now, uh, 16 over 4 is, oh, and we've already taken the limit, so I can get rid of this now, right? We're, that's, that's what happens when we evaluate those limits in, in red there. So we get 4, and that's all being multiplied by 1, which is still 1. Um, 16 over 6 times 2, that's a 16 thirds plus uh, six plus eight, that's going to be uh, 12, 18, 18 plus 16 over three, that's 54 plus 16 over three, which is 70 thirds. And that is the exact area under the curve, under this curve from zero to two using uh, 
the limit definition of the integral. And uh, when you check on your calculator, I really hope you get the, exa the same exact value. Otherwise, I have done something wrong. So uh, I'm just putting that in now. And you get 70 thirds. So they're in agreement. Now, uh, hopefully that wasn't too, too painful for you. But the idea is hopefully doable. Um, okay. Oh, um, one other thing I would like to note. Uh, no, I'll do that a little, a little later. Um, so some, uh, well, first of all, we already established that the limit as n approaches infinity of sigma i equal one to n of f of x sub i times delta x is the area under the curve from a to b or the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So um, some useful properties of integrals is that, and this is a really one you just got to almost, you'll, you'll do them so much you'll almost be robotic. If you've got integral a to b of some constant times f of x dx, um, then you can pull that constant out. That's c times integral a to b of f of x dx. Um, and the reason why you can do that is because at any particular point here, if I multiplied this function by a c, I'd been multiplying by a c, by a c, by a c, by a c, 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 and it would have just come out because it's a constant and limit, and constants can come out of both the summation and the limit. So that's a very useful property. Um, the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. Uh, the integral of a difference is the difference of the integrals. Um, if you have an odd function, a function such that f of negative x is equal to the negative of f of x. So for example, if I had... Um, oh, maybe I want to go over a little more. If I had sine of x, and that's a horrible sketch of sine, but, and this is a negative pi over two, and this is pi over two. And let's say I wanted to find the integral from negative pi over two to pi over two of the sine of x. Well, it's just zero. <laughs> um, see, this function is symmetric because it's odd. So this area, uh, this area is the negative of this area. And we consider, although neg negative area obviously doesn't make sense, we only say it's uh, negative because it's below the x-axis. So the integral, uh, if you are uh, talking about areas, it doesn't necessarily represent the area under the curve. It represents the net the net area under a curve. And that's a very important distinction to make that, uh, you know, someone, I asked ask someone, well, what's an integral? Area under a curve. Um, so it's a lot of times it's a, it's a, it's a misconception. Uh, you know, if you're asked to find the area under the curve of the sine of x from negative pi over two to pi over two, then that's the same thing as, uh, just taking this area and multiplying it by, by two because you can't have a negative area. But if you're asked for this integral, this integral is a net area, and the net area is zero. If you wanted to find the actual area under the curve, you would just do two times the integral from zero to pi over two of the sine of x dx uh, because that would give you your actual area, not your net area, and... From there, you would, uh, well, I mean, I guess we, we I think we, we'd know how to evaluate that, but, um, well, we would get a negative two, and integral of cosine of x is negative, or integral of sine x is negative cosine x, it's going from zero to pi over two, 
Um, and we can actually just evaluate the cosine of x and not keep the negative 2 up front. We get a negative 2 times um, cosine pi over 2 is 0 minus uh, 1. So that's negative 2 times negative 1, or 2. So the total area, this area plus this area, is 2. But the net area from here to here is 0. It's an important distinction to make. Um, and I don't think the textbook makes that distinction either. Oh, also, if you have... Uh, something like this. Some, sometimes textbooks write it a little confusing. But if I've got this function, and I want to integrate it from x value of a to an x value of b, or I want to find this particular area here under this curve, um, then, of course, that's just the integral of a to b of f of x dx. Um, now, of course, if I was to add some point in between these two and call it c, then it should make sense that the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c, oops, from c to b of f of x dx is just the integral from a to b of f of x dx. In other words, this area plus this area gives the total area. Um, let's see. That's that's up to five three now. Um, I will be 